So when Trip gave me a call um, and said, what kind of startup company would you be involved with if you were going to continue in the computer industry? Uh, would it be software or hardware? I immediately said, it's, a, it's software is where I would be because it's shorter, um, uh, shorter lead time in producing products. Um, There's some brilliant people involved that are outside of the uh, mainstream and, um, and yet extremely capable. And um, there, there's not the same investment uh, in terms of capital in order to make hardware, which takes a lead time of two or three years to get uh, a new hardware and chip design and all that stuff done. So software makes all the sense. And Tripp said, I agree with you. Um, I'll get back to you. Well, that was in, he'd just gotten back from Europe uh, trying to figure out what he was going to do after he left Apple. And when he left Apple, uh, Apple had gone, he left Apple in 1982. Apple had had a, an IPO in 1980. So uh, Trip, who was, as I say, I think number 64, the employee number 64, had from the Stanford Business School with an MBA, he'd been um, uh, awarded or, or grant, not granted, but uh, a, allowed to acquire um, quite a bit of Apple stock at that time in lieu of of salary, which was the way that worked at the time. If you joined a ranked startup, you would you would get some stock instead of a high salary. And so that's what Trip had done. And by the time uh, 1982 rolled around, uh, Trip had um, um, had had been able to um, accumulate uh, millions of dollars um, from his Apple stock. So he was independently wealthy at that time at age 28. And he had the, um, therefore, the ability to seed fund a, a startup. And he had gone to Harvard as an undergraduate, and I believe his, at Harvard you have to write your own um, major. Um, and his major, I believe, was strategic gaming. Um, and uh, so he'd always wanted to um, create a company that was based around strategic gaming, frankly. Um, and so he knew uh, we'd stayed in touch, as I, as I, as I said before, uh, as I spent time at Atari. Um, and in July, he called me and uh, four other people, six people all together, uh, to his home in Portola Valley, which is a very upscale neighborhood out in, uh, behind Woodside. And um, we had dinner. Uh, he invited us to dinner. And uh, we talked about um, the kind of company, if, if such were to occur, the type of company we might, might want to, um, to have, to, to, to be a part of. Um, of course, it was going to be based around uh, video games and, and particularly strategic games. But what, what was the, the, the sort of um, idea that we all agreed upon uh, and, and were, were concurred about was the fact that we thought that the home computer could bring, via video games, could bring experiences to people um, like they'd never had before. It was a brand new medium, seemed to us, and would allow people to, to have, because you, you can't physically do everything you might want to, either because you aren't physically capable or you don't have the money to, or it's just not, you know, it's not possible. Uh, you can have those experiences and, 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 and establish an emotional uh, um, relationship with a, a computer, a home computer, and a great video game. Um, and so that's what we wanted to do, was, was open up uh, people's um, uh, abilities to, to uh, seek their dreams, to, to follow their dreams. Um, and so that was kind of the tenor of the, the, the type of company that we all agreed we wanted to, uh, to participate in, that would motivate us to leave our executive positions. The people that Tripp invited to his dinner was, uh, it, was it was I, uh, an MBA classmate of his. We had another classmate um, who uh, was named Bing Gordon, and he was, the, in a, uh, he was an executive at a, um, an advertising agency in San Francisco. He was not technical either. He'd gone to Yale as an undergraduate, 
and his major at Yale was English. And, um, but he was a terrifically brilliant and creative uh, young guy. Um, Tripp was the youngest of the whole group. I was 32, Bing was 32, um, and, and we were, the three of us had known each other at business school, so we, we felt some, I think, some, some common ground. Um, and so I was in the, in, in the um, com computer gaming business, essentially, at Atari, and uh, uh, Bing was in the advertising uh, business, and just an absolute brilliant guy. Um, Tripp also had known um, a, 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 a guy who became vice president of uh, Visicorp, um, vice president of marketing for Visicorp. Visicorp was the company that had created Visicalc. They changed their name from software artists and became Visica Visicorp, and, but their main, main product was Visic Visicalc, um, which uh, you know, at this point, people don't quite remember that um, um, Mitch Caper was actually an employee there, and he left and started Lotus on his own. Uh, and and you know, that was not the first spreadsheet uh, that that made an impact on people. Uh, nor was Excel. So those were all kind of knockoffs of Visicalc. Um, but anyway, Rich Melman uh, was was the vice president of marketing at Visicorp. And Tripp knew him um, uh, from his days at Apple, and so he invited him to dinner as well. Then there were two people that worked for Tripp in the Lisa um, marketing area at Apple. Um, one was David Evans, and the other was Pat Marriott. Pat was the only woman involved. Um, Rich was about 10 years older than the rest of us. Uh, Bing and Dave and Pat and I were all about the same age and Tripp was 28. <laughs> and we were all in our early 30s. But we all had executive type positions in these corporations and none of us was independently wealthy. So we couldn't leave, just drop uh, our, our, leave our jobs without any compensation and, and create uh, a, a startup company. So Tripp and, and actually Rich, who had other um, resources, uh, they were both able to provide the seed funding for the company. Tripp had already incorporated an S-Corp in like May of 82. We were meeting in July. And he had called, he had incorporated the company with the name Amazon Software. And um, of course, as we went along, we all agreed that wasn't the right name <laughs> for the company. Um, but uh, maybe the interesting thing about um, um, what we conceived of was that we didn't believe that we should be creating software. We believed that we should go find authors and, and, and um, um, software artists who were, who were building the, the best software available in the United States and we would become a publisher of it. So we would market and distribute that, comp that, that software and give full credit to the, the artists, that, that uh, individuals or the teams, the small teams who were creating this stuff. Um, and so we, we modeled the, uh, I was a, none of us were really technical. Um, I was an anthropology undergraduate major at Stanford. Um, Dave Evans had a, a, a master's and an undergraduate degree from Stanford, but I believe it was in civil engineering or mechanical engineering, something like that. It was not in computer science. Um, Pat had been a, you know, an, a, a, a cohort and a colleague of trips at Apple. It was not technical, it was marketing. Um, Rich had a physics undergraduate degree from uh, University of California, Berkeley. And so all of us were related, and, but he also had an MBA from Stanford. So five out of the six of us at least were Stanford grads. And none of us was technical. Um, so what we, what we, we had to um, quickly, early on in our existence, we hired uh, a, a CTO. But when we, the, the six of us that came together just wanted to um, try to uh, build a, a publishing company um, that would do the marketing and distribution and sales for the best software we could find in the country created by independent artists. Um, and, um, and so about, a, that was in July, and about uh, August, um, Tripp called me 
and said, okay, are you ready to leave um, uh, your position at Atari because we've, we're, we're starting. In fact, the, all the people that were at dinner have all agreed to, 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 to leave their, their positions and, and, and join the company. Um, and I said, well, um, in that case, yeah, I'm willing. I, if everybody else is, is in, I'm in. And of course, we discovered later that he said that to everybody that he called. Um, <laughs> so we all just jumped on because we thought that everybody else had said yes. We didn't independently um, uh, uh, check on, uh, among ourselves, did Tripp really call you, you and have you already said yes? Um, so I don't know what the sequencing of that was, but I think we all discovered at the end that he said that to everybody. But anyway, it was something that we were all intrigued by, and I thought it was the smartest group of people I'd ever run into, um, I'd ever had an association with. Everybody was absolutely tops. Um, and, and, I, and I liked them all, and I thought, this is going to be a, this, this is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for me. And, um, so I said, yes, I'm in, and I, uh, I gave my two weeks notice at um, uh, Atari, which was the proper thing to do. Uh, in, at that time in the U.S., you gave two weeks notice. And, um, you know, if you were going to go start another company, they, they'd usually waive your, your, or if you were leaving for another company, they'd usually waive the two weeks requirement, and you, you could just leave right away. So I told my, uh, my direct boss um, that I was uh, leaving for a startup um, with friends from Stanford and um, he called this was like at seven o'clock 730 in the evening because we always worked later and the, the president of the international division at Atari had had, had uh, left already for home so my boss called the president um, to say that you know um, Jeff's going to leave and he's giving his notice and, and um, um, I just want to let you know. And he said, put him on the phone. So I got on the phone with this guy and, and he said, Jeff, you know, you were one of our first employees here at the International Division and, uh, for home computers. And he said, we, we, you can't leave us. And first of all, we need you. Uh, you're part of our team. Uh, Atari is a fantastic once-in-a-lifetime corporation, company. Um, Warner Communications will always have a position for you. Um, and and, and you, just, you just can't ignore the fact that this is a unique operation, a unique company, a, a, a fantastic opportunity. And you know, of course, that all startups fail, or 99% of them fail. So you, you're not going to make it. Um, and, and, you know, here you'll always have a position. And I said, well, okay, I, I understand, but I understand what you're saying, but I've thought, th thought it through, and um, I, I, I want to take this opportunity to join my classmates, who I really feel good about, um, and start this company. So I've, I've made my decision. He said, all right then, um, I'm going to make sure that you, I'll personally make sure that you never get a job in Silicon Valley again. And I said, oh, okay, so. And he said, uh, so I want you to, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have you searched, which he did, called the security, had me searched, had my briefcase searched, my desk searched, and I was escorted out of the building. And that was the last I was ever at Atari. <laughs> now, six months later, Atari started to decline. <clears throat> this was August of 1982, and um, it was two, at least two months, uh, before Atari released the um, uh, a cartridge that it had paid. It was a, based on a movie, um, and uh, for they released it for the Christmas season, and. Um, uh, it was called E.T. I was, I was hesitating. I'm, I'm, I was trying to remember what the name of that title was. So Atari had paid, I don't know, something like $20 million to the uh, movie uh, production company for the rights to do the E.T. game because there was a lot of hype about E.T. I don't think it was a Steven Spielberg uh, production, I believe. 
anyway, the Atari had anticipated that it'd be a great movie, and they wanted to have an accompanying video game on their cartridge machine um, for the Christmas season. Um, so they uh, paid for the rights. They got one of their top um, developers, uh, put them under a lot of pressure. I think he had six months to create an ET game for the cartridge. And, um, and then there was this phenomenon that um, the, pr the previous year, this, this Christmas season of 1981 was when they had released um, Pac-Man on the, the, uh, their video game cartridge, uh, uh, VCS. Yeah, that's what they called it, VCS. Um, video computer system, I think, is what it's, that stood for. Anyway, the previous Christmas time, they had underestimated the demand for Pac-Man. It was a very popular game. It had been a great uh, game in the um, arcade business. And so when they released it for the home video game uh, system um, uh, at Christmas in 1981, they hadn't made enough copies, no, enough cartridges. And the cartridge manufacturing and, 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 and uh, time lead, lead times were way too long to be able to resupply the, the, the shelves that were emptied out before Christmas. And so the, rep, the, the Atari used sales reps all over the United States to sell their products into um, retail stores. Uh, the rep organizations were furious because they had been put on allocation for ET and there weren't enough and they, they felt like they had uh, the opportunity cost had, had been huge, whereas they could have sold millions of more dollars worth of ET cartridges had they had them for the 1981 Christmas season. But here we were in 1982, ET was a big hyped um, success story that was going to happen and, and Atari was going to release the cartridge about the same time as, uh, you know, similar timing as the movie. And so they wanted to take advantage of that and all of the sales rep firms around the country had placed as high an order for quantities of ET cartridges as they possibly could. I think there were limits on, again, they were under allocation and that made them think, oh my God, we better uh, order the max. And uh, I know, I remember hearing a story about a, the, the rep firm in, in Dallas told the rep firm in El Paso, you know, because Texas had about three or four rep firms uh, spread around the, 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 the state told the guy in El Paso to order the top amount he was allowed to and any that he couldn't sell in West Texas, the guy in, in Dallas would buy from him so he could you know, keep, have, have extra supply for the, the central Texas area around Dallas. And so all of the rep firms did that way and that, that created a situation where um, uh, Atari uh, produced to that level, to the level, level of the orders that were getting received by, uh, uh, by them from their rep firms. And of course there were a, a good few months before the release of it in order to manufacture and ship and bring all the cartridges to uh, uh, get them out into the marketplace. Um, and so this is, I think, a reflection of the early 80s problems with um, financial reporting that no longer exists, thank goodness, but back then the management software for corporations, um, large companies, and especially fast-growing ones, was not sophisticated enough to give them real-time statistics. So there was always a half-month lag between um, what actually happened in a month and when the management was aware of it because it took, you know, they, they took they, even though they were using computers, they were still using, uh, I don't know, IBM 360s that produced blue bar uh, reports and so the, the accounting departments of these companies, there was like two weeks into the next month before they could report on what happened the previous month. Well. Um, so there was, there was a, this, this reporting lag situation and, and what, what I think ended up happening was that it turned out that, that um, Atari had ordered manufacturing of more ET cartridges than they actually had uh, VCS units installed in the United States. 
So um, there was no way that all of them would sell through because there weren't even enough machines out there to, 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 to accommodate the number of cartridges they'd ordered um, and produced. Well, it turned out that, um, as we all now can look back and see, uh, E.T., the game on the cartridge machine, was absolutely terrible. Um, if you look at it now, you see what, what I mean. It was, it was unintelligible what was going on in the game. It was stupid looking. It was, people hated it. It didn't relate well to the movie at all. So it didn't sell. It didn't sell off the shelves. And they had made all these extra copies, and they couldn't move them off the shelves. And um, that really burned the, 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 the 1982 Christmas season for um, Atari. And it didn't hurt the, the, the um, uh, coin-op sales or operations, and so that was still going along and very profitable for Atari. But Atari was the, at that time, was the primary mm, growth uh, engine for uh, Warner Communications, because Warner Communications in the early 80s, were, they were not putting out, uh, their movies were not being terribly successful. So the growth at Warner was based almost entirely on the growth of, of Atari. Well, so the analysts um, in, uh, and of course Warner was a, a, a public company, analysts had predicted, or the company had predicted, that it's fourth quarter 1982 uh, revenue growth and profits would, would be at a, reach a certain uh, point higher than the year before. And as a result of this terrific uh, disaster in the ET cartridge sales, they had to modify, uh, with the analysts on Wall Street, had to modify their growth and profit projections for Warner. It wasn't that they lost money, it was that they just weren't going to grow as robustly in either uh, category of profits or sales as they had previously anticipated. Well, as you know, that was a signal um, uh, to the market and uh, the Warner Communications stock took a big hit in like November or early December. I don't remember exactly what those dates were because I was at Electronic Arts and wasn't paying attention particularly to, to Atari. But also at the time, um, that fall, there, the SEC uh, brought charges against the CEO and I believe CFO at Atari for insider trading because they had sold a bunch of their uh, Warner Communications stock that they had gotten as um, you know uh, extra compensation that that they owned. They had sold it um, prior to the uh, adjustment in the uh, an announcement of the d not as high a growth. Uh, uh, rate as they'd previously predicted and of course so they made a lot of profit before the market knew that the, got the signal that something was going on at Atari and so the SEC uh, um, prosecuted them. Um, they settled of course so that was white collar crime uh, insider trading and they settled I think they had to pay back I don't know how they settled it I don't remember how that happened but it made the newspaper, and um, and I don't. And Atari never fully recovered from that. Uh, they tried lots of different things. Um, the next few years, within three years, I believe Atari had sold out to Jack Tramiel, who was owner of the Com of Commodore at the time, um, one of their biggest competitors. Uh, Warner had 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 sold Atari to Jack. And, um, and then Jack, um, you know, he tried uh, to make a success of, of Commodore uh, and Atari, and um, they produced a, a, a product, that Commodore did, called the Amiga, which was actually a very good, sophisticated uh, home computer. Um, and, and then there were some ups and downs, but eventually, you know, the whole, that, those two companies together basically went out of business. Uh, Atari still exists in some kind of intellectual property world. <laughs> I don't know who has it, who owns some, I think somebody in France, some company in France ended up buying it. 
Um, but there's, a, um, there's an interesting story to go along with that, which is that this, this um, a young man who um, um, had been the spokesperson, really, at CES's for uh, Atari's home computers, um, back when we were first talking about creating electronic arts, um, uh, Tripp had asked me if I could uh, arrange for him to go to uh, CES in Chicago. This is the summer. Summer CES was in June. This was before dinner at Tripp's house or anything. And I said, sure. He wanted to get to know the, the video game industry better. So I got him a, um, a badge for Atari so he could get into CES. And uh, he went to Chicago. And there he met uh, this young man. Uh, who was, was extolling the virtues of the uh, Atari home computer, and Tripp and he had a, had a, a, a discussion, and Tripp was just, he and Tripp just hit it off, and they, they were thinking the same way, they had the same style of, of expressing themselves and thinking, and, um, and so they, they both were impressed with each other. So within a few months of our having started um, um, Electronic Arts, uh, Trip, uh, this guy was only like 17 or maybe he was, no, I think he was still 17 because um, we had to, uh, Trip wanted to hire him at Electronic Arts. Um, not for any specific thing, but just because he was so brilliant and he knew that he had potential and he wanted to, you know, get him involved with Electronic Arts. And, um, and so I, I think. Uh, Tripp had to agree to become the guardian of this young man um, in order to allow him to, his parents to allow him to move to um, Silicon Valley or to Portola Valley actually and work at Electronic Arts even though he was underage. Um, so he did that and, and the guy ended up working for me in the international division. That's what I started uh, with Atari to do was build up an international business and um, he ended up working for me and ended up um, moving to England when we opened a, a UK subsidiary and he's been there ever since. He worked at Atari for about 26 years and had, had became the president of Atari Europe. No, I'm sorry, Electronic Arts. Became the president of Electronic Arts Europe and, and then after he left Electronic Arts, um, this was about the time that the IP for Atari was still kind of floating around in, in, in France. And, and he was able to become his childhood dream, which was CEO of Atari. So he took control of all these uh, assets of titles and intellectual property that Atari, the, 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 the whatever corporation had, had acquired this uh, asset base. Uh, he was able to become president of, uh, of Atari, which was his, his dream. It didn't last very long, and, and he's now a venture capitalist but in, in London, but he's still in London. Um, he was extremely successful, and, and, and interestingly enough, his um, firm was one of the very early investors in Supercell. And so they just they did a tr had, a made a, had a tremendous success with, with that investment. Um, and uh, uh, so he's still around, he comes to, he and I are still in touch and still good friends. So um, that was an interesting story that started back when he was like 16, maybe he was even 15 when I first met him at uh, CES uh, related to uh, Atari. But Atari just um, kind of just disappeared. Um, I hear rumors every once in a while that, oh no, somebody's gonna take their, their intellectual property for some of those earlier games and um, bring them back to life in some form, maybe on a handheld, but it hasn't happened and I, I don't expect it to. But, but I believe that the, the decline of Atari started with the ET cartridge disaster and, and they never quite recovered from that. Um, so it's very interesting.